This week on CrossFeed. The American Family Association does not want you to fix it up. Teaching yoga, is that teaching religion? A new edition of the Greek New Testament. Raped by demons? Can you be cyberbullied by your son? Hello, everyone. Welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. Hey, I'm Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. It's good to be back with everyone again after we've been gone a few weeks. I uh, just it wasn't feeling too good the last couple of weeks, so uh, I kind of bailed on that. i just been feeling really exhausted. Actually, just before the, tonight, um, about an hour ago, I fell asleep sitting watching television. And uh, just not about an hour ago, and then I was just like, "Wow, I don't know." It's been real tired lately. Jim's getting older, I'm getting and older. Uh, <laughs> I have that problem too. But I have small. That's yeah. So you you, you haven't even hit forty yet. You're yeah. cutting out. You're, I can't hear you. Four. Looks like we're having a few issues with choppiness. Dude, we're in trouble. Yeah, you're not choppy, but your voice ain't coming through. Hmm. Um. Okay, you seem to be coming through now. <laughs> okay. Well, apologies, any everybody, if there's any problems um, with this. And uh, and by the way, we are recording this on November 11th, 2012. Um, which is the dual day. Uh, uh, Dale's church celebrated Persecution Christians Day. Uh, my congregation, of course, so we, we remembered uh, Veterans Day. But we did have a prayer for Christians who are persecuted around the world, too. Mm-hmm. Yep, and we had a prayer for the military. Very good. Um, let's see here. Well, speaking of persecuted religions, how about yoga? Is yoga a persecuted religion? Is yoga a religion? Is teaching yoga in public schools teaching a religion? Okay. So, th- I mean, this is an interesting question, and this is something that seems to be happening um, more and more. Yoga is becoming more accepted into um, sort of the mainstream. Um, you know, even I remember a few years back we got uh, We Fit. Um, you know, for the Nintendo Wii, and it has yoga integrated into it. Um, into or no, no, I take it back. It wasn't even that. It was, uh, it, it predated that. It was a exercise thing for the PlayStation. Um, that used a camera and, um, and it, it yeah, it had a whole yoga component of it. You couldn't even disable the yoga stuff if you didn't want to do it. It was part of your exercise regimen, and um. So if you didn't want to do that, you just failed on that part of it. So, um, so here's the big question: Is yoga religion? All right, yoga is it comes from Hinduism, um, and so the question is: the way it's practiced today, um, is it or, or can it be done without being religion? Um, there's certainly a lot of martial arts that are based in Eastern. Uh, religions that, but are practiced by people of, of, um, you know, without, without the religious components. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of Christian, uh, martial arts schools out there where they, they use it as a, a way to, um, to convey the gospel to people. Um, it depends on the martial art though. Uh, generally the harder ones are more focused on the physical and the softer ones are more focused on the spiritual. But what about yoga? So anyway, this is out in um, California around El Ca- uh, University of San Diego and um, El Camino and all that area. And these parents are concerned. Um, this group is called the, the – is paying for this is in the, in the CS Union School District – um is um 
oh, I can't remember the name of the group uh, offhand. Oh, uh, the Joyce Foundation. And it's a nonprofit organization that promotes Ashtanga yoga across the world. And uh, some of the parents are saying, yes, this is uh, very much a religious thing. Um, because yoga serves um, um, as a religious expression or a way to invite Hindu deities into the body. Uh, others are saying, no, it's just kind of an exercise and it's nothing more than that. Um, I mean, I don't know. My view is, um, I don't know, I, kind of almost like uh, Paul dealing with uh, the whole issue of eating meat in Corinth. You know, some people got upset saying it's sacrificed to demons, or uh, sacrificed to false gods, and Paul's like, there's only one God anyway, it really doesn't make any much difference, don't really worry, don't worry about it, but if you worry about it, don't do it. So, but at the same time, you know, is it, we, we would also say that you shouldn't get involved in spiritism and you know, if, if someone said, oh, I'm using a Ouija board, we would say, ah, that's not a good idea because you're opening yourself up to the demonic. And, um, you know, and so that's the other side of this is, uh, are the, is, is this demonic or is it a stripped down version of it that probably shouldn't even be called yoga? Um, you know, it's, it, it's sort of like, uh, it's like the, the YMCA, all right? Um, yeah, it's it's not really a Christian organization anymore. You know, it, it's right nowadays. It's just a nonprofit health club. You know, oh, they even dropped the word Christian out of it. Yeah, it's just the Y now. And uh, I, I think that Christian is still, or Jesus Christ, or something like that, is still in their mission statement somewhere. But it's you know, for the most, they're they're they've completely de-emphasized it. So. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think I agree with Jim. Because, I mean, I know of, I know of churches that do yoga, and um, there's a, a church around here uh, that does has yoga classes. Has somebody come in and and do various fitness things, and they have incorporated yoga into it. Um, I've talked to the pastor, he's a good friend of mine. Um, you know, and in fact, he asked me my thoughts on it when they were considering it. And, um, and he comes in and does a Bible study, uh, connected, um, you know, is part of the class. And, um, and he said, you know, he's, he said, I've, 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 I've been a part of it. I've, I've, I've listened and, and watched and, and stuff. And he says, to me, all I see is some relaxation techniques and, you know, I, I don't, there's no sort of talk about moving your energy and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Um, that you can do it without all of the mysticism. Right. So the scary thing about asking Dale what he thought about yoga, he said he probably he said I thought it was better with Boo Boo and Mister Rain. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> that's another story altogether. Uh, anyhow, this guy who the, the 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 lawyer, of course, the, you'd expect the lawyer to say this, you know. Uh, he says uh, there's uh, spiritual overtones in any type of yoga, but this Ashtanga is the particular religious type. Ultimate yoga has its formation and foundation and basis in Eastern mysticism and Hinduism, he said. With yoga period, there's always some connection with religious and spiritual beliefs. Um, the school district, uh, the director of the, of, the, um, the, of the foundation that's paying for this, uh, this Joyce Foundation, says, well, it's pretty difficult to do anything that doesn't have some relationship to some religion. And to a certain extent, he's right about that. I mean, uh, you know, you and I have even talked about how silly some groups are, you know, for getting, you know, getting rid of Easter eggs and calling them spring spheres, or um, you know, getting rid of Christmas and calling it the sparkle season. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this is one of those things. I think it's it's a good idea. Um, you know, if if you're considering it for yourself or, or if your kid's school is doing it or something like that, uh, you know, if you have concerns, ask to sit in on a session, mm -hmm. you know, and, and take a look and decide for yourself. If, if this comes across as a, uh, as a spiritual thing, you know, then, you know, I have concerns about this and, you know, I, I'd like to, 
some other alternative offered for my kid or, you know, or, or let's work something out. And, um, and, and if it seems to just be a sort of relaxation thing, um, then fine. You know, when, when I was on the other school, hand, where do you get to the idea that what's good for the goose is good for the gander? You know, if we're going to have Annie Gaynor running out there with her Freedom from Religion Foundation and trying to erase all ideas of Christianity from the public square, and we've talked about a few of her, her, her goofy lawsuits, mm-hmm. then where isn't she, why isn't she running over here? Oh, no, I, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I've, I've wondered about that, too. You know, wh- why is the, um, why only Christianity? I mean, I, I tell you the answer, because... Her, it's actually her mom and Gaylord. I don't know. She's like named after her mom, sort of a junior kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and it was her mom must have like had a bad experience with, with some Christian church or something like that and turned her off so bad that she decided she was going to take down the whole church. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so. seriously. I mean, you know. But yeah, I mean, if it's this idea that some church school districts are saying, "Oh, well, if it had any, any, you know, you know, running through Bible verses on the football field, uh, no, that's that's a, that's a church, just that that's that breaks down the separation of church and state." Then at what point does this do it? I mean, you know, you, you come to the almost you did that same question. Mm-hmm. You know, I think you and I don't have a problem with this because we're not these hypersensitive people to church and state issues anyway. But if you're one of these hyper sensitive people then why aren't you hypersensitive to this yeah yeah i mean that's the funny thing is that when you see people protesting yoga uh, whether in churches or schools or whatever it's the christians that are complaining about it you know um so yeah no th- this year is really inconsistent you know that just you know dawned to me as we we're, we're going to this. hey speaking of um parents having real issues with their kids since you mentioned Annie Gaynor's mother. Right. This is kind of interesting. It's kind of sad. Uh, so this is out by Fresno, California, uh, Visalia, California, and uh, Calvary Church, probably associated with uh, Cal- the, the Calvary Church uh, group down out there in California. Pastor by the name of uh, Bob Grenier and his wife Gail, and... Uh, they have a son, Alex. He's 40 years old. And he's launched a website called Calvary Chapel Abuse. He did this a couple of years ago. And uh, he's posted accusations by his father committed felony child abuse against him and his three brothers. And this has been going on for some time. And so finally, they have filed a lawsuit against their son claiming defamation of character. <laughs> This is so sad. I just, you know, the, the, um, all right, we, we don't know what the truth is. And the son claims that, um, that the, the purpose of the lawsuit, uh, or, or the, or what, what he hopes to happen uh, through this is that the truth comes out. Um, it's, uh, little complicated in that the uh, statute of limitations for felony physical abuse of a child is three years and this happened in the 1980s and 90s uh, allegedly Um, so now interestingly the um, one of the brothers uh, who is also estranged from his parents um, agrees with his brother and that certainly gives credence to the claim well, at least, you know, yeah, a little bit. Uh, of course, I think it's kind of funny. Um, and I think, you know, this is Alex Grenier lives in Idaho. Uh, he has not seen the lawsuit, does not have a lawyer. He said he will represent himself for now. So Alex, he's a fool for a lawyer. <laughs> whoever represents himself is a fool for a lawyer. Just, just so you know that. Yep. Yeah. So, um, man, this stuff, this is so sad. But yeah, it, interesting that, they would use cyberbullying. I I'm not sure that what's that that line from the Princess Bride. I don't think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, on the I mean, definitely defamation. Yeah. Um. Yeah, they can argue that. Um. 
and uh, it's it's pretty pretty uh, uh, you know the the other person by the way they said there's a former member of this Calvary Church that also has been um, Tim Taylor uh, has also been commenting and also says it's true, but. Uh, you know, but apparently he's still at this church, so they don't believe the the thing. And he either was or is a uh, police chaplain. Yeah, yeah, which is sort of interesting in and of itself. You know, because certainly they they at least do background checks. Of course, he he's never been accused before, never been convicted. He wouldn't have a any sort of criminal record. Um. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, apparently his church, which they obviously are aware of that this is going on, um, you know, that, that these claims are being made, um, they have chosen to, at least for the most part, side with their pastor. Uh, this can be really devastating for churches though, um, just because it just, it raises those questions. Um, you know, and it, it causes people to say, well, you know, why would he be making these accusations and, you know. Um, and, and it can really hurt a, a pastor's uh, reputation. So it's a, I, I, it's a sad situation. It's just, there's almost you know once the once the accusation is out, but you can't really win. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, you you can't. There's nothing you're gonna be able to do. And you wanna you wanna restore the relationship, you know, with your kid too. Um, and and how do you do it? And you know, to have to, th- that the only way you can stop it is with a lawsuit. Um, uh, there's not going to be no any restoration here. It's going to be a very ugly situation. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it it does remind me of a great line from the original uh, Spider-Man movie. Um, that's slander. No, it's not. It's libel. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay. Well, we talked earlier about seeing a, 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 a religious agenda in yoga. How about a homosexual agenda and an anti-bullying program? Uh, <laughs> okay. All right. So we have to like put up our American Family Association flag um, because that's who we're dealing with here. Okay. <laughs> and they're always, you know, good for a chuckle. Uh, well, this time, I mean, I, I like the fact that they call them a conservative evangelical group. They go beyond conservative. <laughs> they're, they're, they're sort of, the, the American Family Association is like the Westboro Baptist light. <laughs> uh, yeah, although I will give them credit for, you know, you know, talking about certain television shows and some other stuff about how it, you know, some of the stuff, you know. Is damaging. Although a couple of things, I, I caught times I've caught them taking things out of completely out of context. Right, right. So yeah, I mean they're like they're like okay. So you've got if you know, focus on the family, you know they're they're probably on on the the scale of 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 this sort of stuff. Um, they're probably like a three or four. All right, and then American Family Associations is at about a six or seven. And then Westboro Baptist, well, they're like a 20. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, still, anyway. So, okay. So, I don't think this is such a bad idea myself. Okay. There's a thing that's been going on for about 11 years, 11 years now. Started by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And it's called Mix It Up at Lunch Day. Um, And basically, you are. The kids are encouraged or, in some cases, required to hang out with someone they might not normally speak to at the lunch table. Yeah, you um, assign numbers, and, and then the administration uh, sort of has assigned seating for lunch. And they make you sit with people that you wouldn't normally sit with. And the idea is to break down cliques and, um, you know, and, and promote understanding of – uh, of different people, because I mean, let's face it, the lunch lunch hour is is it's a clicky time. Uh, oh yeah, um, the uh, well, the movie Mean Girls. Uh, I you know I remember you know she 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 mapped out the lunch table and the the book that that movie is based on Queen Bees and Wannabes. Yeah, they showed one girl showed the the map she wrote at the lunch table. 
You know, there's the plastics, there's the goths, there's the stoners, there's the jocks, there's, you know, and all these different cliques are all running around there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And since I have daughters, High School Musical um, did something similar. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, so, yeah, it's a very clicky time. So I don't think that is necessarily a bad thing. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, one school even mentioned they have a lot of um, kids with disabilities, and they said, you know, this is a way to to help other kids that may feel uncomfortable around those with disabilities to help them get to know them as people. Right, uh, but you know, depending depending what table I'd be at, man, I might be scared to death anyway. Uh, you know, I may may not work there, it, you know. May wind up, you know, helping the bullies find new targets. <laughs> well, yeah, I haven't seen you before. <laughs> Give me your lunch money, kid. <laughs> you didn't want to eat that food anyway, did you? <laughs> so, um, so, but there's uh, American Family Association is saying that it is a homosexual agenda. Um, because kids might meet some gay kids and decide that they're okay. Uh, you know, it's a, you know, uh, 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 you know, now one of the pre- people behind it, I don't know, I can't remember if she's a was it school or she works at the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, yeah, yeah, she's part of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Does say many of the targets of bullying are kids who are either gay or perceived as gay. Now, she mm-hmm. doesn't say all. She says many. Well, that's true. Absolutely. And many of them are also uh, special needs kids. Many of them are, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why um, kids Smart are bullied. kids, I mean, you kids know. with high voices, you know, boys with high voices, uh, you know, somebody that, uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's high school, all right? People get picked on for anything. And if there's no, if there's, if you're, if they can't figure something out, they'll make something up. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, no, if, if there's something real obvious, that just makes it easy. And so you're an easy target. And, and certainly the gay kids, yeah, they get targeted. Right. I mean, we, we can we certainly understand that. Uh, but, you know, on the flip side, the Southern Poverty Law Center has also declared the uh, American Family Association is a hate group and has now listed it with... Um, you know, neo-Nazi groups and uh, black separatists and Holocaust deniers and all kinds of other folks, which isn't exactly a, you know, which is a problem. Yeah. You know, I can't remember what it was I was reading about over the summer. I was dealing with something and um, I can't remember what it was was before the election, and it was some conservative group. And it kept being pointed out, which the Southern Paul Poverty Law Center has, has classified as a hate group. It's like, well, just because they classified it as a hate group doesn't mean it necessarily is. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, are they the sole arbitrary, you know, arbitrator, you know, uh, deciders of who is and who is not a hate group? You know, what gave them the distinction of making that decision at all times? Yeah. You know, what is their criteria? <laughs> What's their authority? Yeah, what's their authority and what's their criteria? I mean, you know, um, I can't remember what group it was because, you know, I kept seeing that this one group, you know, kept, you know, people kept referring to it as, you know, you know, because this group said it's a hate group. Yeah. See, what that does is then, uh, as soon as you apply that label, then you, all of a sudden, that organization loses all credibility. Nobody's even going to hear them out. Um, and so, so all it takes, and, and especially groups that, um, that would, uh, speak out against, um, you know, against gay marriage or, or anything like that. They're, you automatically uh, label them a hate group and then nobody will listen to them. Oh, that's a hate group. Oh, I'm not going to listen to what they say, you know? And, um, so, uh, and uh, yeah, that doesn't help. Um, now certainly there's, there's some, pretty spiteful stuff coming out of the American Family Association. Okay. Um, they, 
And and that's the thing that really bothers me about their attack on this mix it up thing. Because they should be saying, um, hey, you know what? There's this thing going on. This is a great chance for you to share the gospel with somebody that you wouldn't normally um, have connections with. I mean, how cool is that? <laughs> you know, this is this is your chance to, to make some friends with people outside your normal sphere of influence and expand your sphere of influence um, so that you can show people Christ's love that you might not normally have the opportunity to, you know? Don't respond to them the way they expect you to. Uh, ex- respond to them in love. Respond to them. You know, you can accept people without affirming their lifestyle. Um, well, their lifestyles. Okay, and um, and and that can be just a tremendous thing. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, I mean, that's how I treat Dale all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know. I understand his lifestyle of bringing God and all these kids and stuff, but I always affirm him. You know, and we get along real well. So you know, I I would say that um, that I would love it if uh, if I looked out into the congregation on Sunday morning and saw a handful of um, of gay couples sitting there. It'd be great. I mean, just to have the opportunity to uh, share the gospel with people that tend to get marginalized, you know, from Christianity and stuff like that. If if there was a way that um, that we could be inviting, you know, to them. I want to do that. I'm not going to affirm those lifestyle choices, um, but at the same time, I'm going to let them know Jesus loves you, and he came to forgive our sins and to make us a new creation. Yep. Which is what it's all about. Mm-hmm. So, um, I have no segue over to the next two stories. I just, I can't think of one, so let's just deal with them. Well, okay. Uh, okay, let's see. Here, 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 let's see. Uh, earlier we were talking about... Uh, I'm talking about inviting spirits into, um, inviting yeah, the inviting spirits. Okay, let's go that one. I, I had another one connecting Jeff Kloha, but uh, well, let's we'll talk about inviting spirits. I'll let you deal with this one. This is a kind of a bizarre story. This is really bizarre, but it's the sort of thing that tends to come out of Africa. All right, this one's in Uganda. Um, so we have the story of this woman. Uh, her name is Rachel, and um. And she is being raped by demons. Um, she's having, after she falls asleep, uh, it's basically, it's a recurring dream. Um, but she believes that it's not just a dream, um, but rather is a evil spirit that attacks and sexually abuses her. And um, that she's... Uh, Uh, it's destroying her marriage because it's, it's bothering her husband, uh, that this is going on. She'll scream in the middle of the night and it's scaring her kids. Um, I mean, you Not know, just her to, a lot of good either. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause she's about to lose her job. I mean, you, you also have to, um, th- something that, that sort of caught me is, um, it says that, uh, Whenever she's sleeping, she hears someone entering her bedroom, unwrapping her mosquito net, and out of the blue, uh, she feels the heavy weight of a man squeezing her chest so hard that she can hardly breathe properly. Um, and I, I went, mosquito net? Oh, yeah, Uganda, malaria, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I just take so many things for granted here. Um, but uh, the, it's just it's a terrible experience for her, and, and she... Um, she believes that that um that it's a demonic she um there is evil there that does not sleep has sought she went to a witch doctor that made it worse no big surprise there um and uh sounds like from psychological uh counseling nothing's helping there um and so, I don't know, this is, this is a bizarre story. I don't <laughs> well, one of the first questions is, do you believe that demons are real? Okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, that, that's a kind of one of the, the first places I think we've got to all begin at, is that, you, you know, is, uh, um, you know, I mean, because a lot of people are going to look at this and go, this is really stupid, you know, demons don't exist in the first place. Mm-hmm. 
you know, so that's, that's, uh, you know, always kind of an important, uh, position is, is some of these things. Um, you know, it's amazing how many, you know, people, you know, I mean, for some people, the whole you have de- demons are, themselves is kind of a silly thing. Um, right. especially because here in the United States, we don't see demons. too many cases of demons and stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And yet, um, the Bible, you know, Jesus affirmed, uh, that there are demons. Uh, he cast out many of them and, um, and there were even ones the disciples couldn't and Jesus could. Uh, although I do have to kind of laugh. I, I, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. If it, um, you know, uh, uh, um, the first is, you know, watching you stay, stay sexually pure so that you don't get, um, uh, um, control through sexually transmitted demons. <laughs> yeah. 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 That was kind of bizarre. But the thing I, um, when, when I was in college, I, I had a dream that, that a demon was sitting on me and, and I felt this heavy weight on me and, and I prayed to God to, um, to save me. And then I instantly woke up and it was gone. Um, but I was just sort of chalked it up to a dream. It was, it was really vivid. I mean, that I felt this weight on me. Um, but, uh, and so reading this sort of, I had forgotten about it until I read this and sort of brought it back. Um, you know, one of the other questions is, did she have, is, is this actually a psychological thing that, um, she was, she's had some, some sort of repressed memory kind of thing, um, that this is dredging up, you know, and, and that's a possibility. But, um, you know, I, the thing that, you know, that I'm questioning is, is can a demon sexually assault you? You know, what are they capable of doing? I do believe in the demonic, but I, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's not my specialty, you know? Um, and I don't know what they can and can't do to a person. Yeah. I, I, I don't know either. I mean, uh, this is, I mean, this whole story just kind of bizarre. Um, and it's, you know, it's not, I mean, it's not researched, you know. I mean, so they have the Archbishop of Uganda, Church of Uganda. He said, he said about petty people have been attacked by demons in dreams. Um, you know, which, okay, I, I can believe that. That doesn't. But then they have the Stephen Langa, Counselor Family Network. And, you know, he says, uh, he gives the experience of a former witch doctor he watched being interviewed on TV. Woman said her assignment was to bring down high ranking men. Her main weapon was, weapon was sex. She would do whatever she could in order to lure the man she was targeting into sex. She added that once the man had sex with her, he was finished. Because from this point onward, she would control him and dictate whatever she wanted him to do. This control is made possible through sexually transmitted demons. And I'm going, okay, so our evidence is this person who claims she, it's, it's, I mean, you know, this is secondhand, something that you claim you watched on television. On TV, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm looking at this going, yeah, the journalism in Uganda is a little bit different than it is in the United (laughs) States. Um, But, so, you know, um, the the comments on this um, story, I mean, there's all these people going, yeah, that happened to me too, you know. and, uh, but, and over and over people, I mean, people are given the right advice, uh, pray to Jesus and, you know, get in, in the, you know, be reading the Bible and stuff. And there's some people say, put a Bible under your pillow. I, uh, I don't, <laughs> it's not a magic charm. Um, but, uh, I mean, there are demons and the only weapon God has given to us, uh, to use against them is the word of God. All right. Um, not to sort of physically use against them in some way or, or put it under your pillow as a, as a good luck charm or, uh, or something like that. Um, but rather to be reading it and meditating on it and praying and, you know, and, um, about it and, and discussing it with, with other believers. And, you know, I mean, yeah, that's, that's the, what you need to combat against this. Now, exactly what's going on here, you know, this, this brings to mind, um, 
it's I think it's it's uh, general knowledge that the movie The Exorcist was very loosely based on a true story. Very loosely, okay? More like inspired by, okay? Um, but the original, the actual, the actual event that the movie was inspired by, um, was actually a Missouri Synod Lutheran family. Um, the, um, uh, Concordia Seminary St. Louis has a write up in their library on the event. Um, and they, I mean, this, it was a boy, um, it was a girl in the movie, it was a boy in real life, and there were professors from the seminary that, uh, he was at Barnes Hospital, and, um, I mean, there was some really bizarre stuff, they asked how many, um, how many demons are possessing you, and he rolled up his pants leg, and there, the number one appeared on his leg, um, you know, there was like things levitating and stuff. And I mean, they brought in all this instrumentation to detect magnetic fields. And, you know, they were trying to find, okay, what's really causing this. And it wasn't until they had with every instrument they could find, um, you know, rule it all out before they said, okay, uh, I think we need to chalk this one up to demonic possession and proceed from there. Uh, they didn't have Egon Spengler with this, you know, um, <laughs> what do you, PKE meter or whatever it is. Um, but, uh, so, you know, uh, but my tendency with these sort of things is to say, all right, let's first look for a natural explanation. And, uh, and, and if not, then look for a supernatural one. But the thing is, at the same time, um, this is in Uganda, this is in Africa, and, this sort of stuff tends to happen a lot more in Africa, and, and I understand why. All right? In the United States, where people tend to disbelieve in demons, it's, it's like uh, C.S. Lewis said in his Forward to the Screwtape letters, that um, you know people you can either believe in demons too much or too little, and uh, Satan will take an atheist or a sorcerer, he doesn't care which. And, um, you know, here in the United States, uh, people tend to disbelieve in demons and, and Satan says, that's just fine. You just, you know, think that we're not here and then, you know, we can, we can do our work and, uh, and you won't believe in us. And so you won't turn to God for help, you know, because as soon as you acknowledge there's a spiritual realm, then you need to look for a spiritual answer. Um, on the other hand, over in Africa, um, there's, there's like no atheists in Africa. I mean, there's some, but it's, it's less than 1%. Um, and like far less. And so, I mean, they're, they, they're very much believe in the spiritual. That's why you have witch doctors all over the place. And, um, and so for them, their Satan strategy is, okay, let's make people fear, um, the demonic so that um, so that they look for solutions outside of Christ and um, make them afraid and, and think that, that Jesus can't save them. And um, so it's a different tactic uh, based on where people are at spiritually. And, and so that's, I, I mean, I believe that's why you see that sort of phenomenon happening over there and you don't see it happening around here. I am wondering, why are you here? That could be. So, I, I mean, I would certainly say this is more likely to be actual uh, demonic activity there than here when it's something like this. Because I, I, um, uh, demons are much more overt over there than here. Here it's... Uh, I've, I've got a friend of mine... Um, that uh, has been involved in some exorcisms here. He talks about how uh, he was in a house and it was the middle of winter and all the windows were open and um, and it was like 90 degrees in the house and it wasn't a bad furnace or thermostat or anything like that. It was you know there was no ex no other explanation for it and um, he was involved in exercising the demonic out of that house. And, uh, you know, and this is a, a family that, or a, a couple, um, 
that had been involved in some pretty, um, well, the sort of things you shouldn't get involved in and, and that, and they were sort of inviting this kind of stuff into their lives. And, um, and, and so he was involved in, in ridding those demons and, uh, people became Christians and, uh, you know, it was, it was a really powerful thing. So, um, yeah, I absolutely, uh, believe in this stuff. <laughs> I also have friends that, uh, used to be mediums and, uh, and used to use Ouija boards and things like that by themselves. Um, not the sort of charlatan kind of stuff. They weren't doing it for money. They were doing it for, um, because they were interested in the spiritual realm and, uh, were making contact with demons and, uh, they were giving them information they wouldn't normally have and, and things like that to, um, to prove, uh, what they were. And I mean, that's pretty scary. Uh, as far as I know, um, the couple of people that I know that were involved in it got out of it. Um, but, uh, uh, in one case, um, the demon, uh, ruined, uh, the, she was talking to this demon and, and he said, well, I got to go. I'm going to go slash someone's tires. And when she went and, um, to go somewhere, she had a flat tire. <laughs> I didn't know he was talking about mine. <laughs> um, you know, so. Don't know. Don't know. You have more experience with this stuff than I do. I just live in Massachusetts. We don't believe in anything up here. So. <laughs> um, well, you mentioned the seminary, so let's go down to a seminary professor. This was on Concordia Theology, Theological Theology Blog. Um, and it's kind of interesting that, um, a new edition of the Nestle Allen Greek New Testament has been uh, published. It's the 28th edition. And this one, there are some um, significant changes from the past. Um, they've got some really different changes that they are doing. Um, for example... Uh, Dale and I both learned that there are four types of manuscripts, basically. There's Alexandrian, Western, and Caesarean, and I can't remember what the fourth one was, but there are four. But matter of fact, I, I found this card that uh, our um, uh, one of my New Testament profs gave us, and we stuck at the beginning, told us to stick in the big beginning of the Bible, or our New Testament. I never figured out why, but, uh, you know, he gave it to us and told us to. I have, uh, I have but one now of they're cards. saying, you know what? Well, the visions aren't really meaningful. You know, so something that's cards. been taught to seminarians for decades, and now they're going, eh, you know, this is not, this is not as meaningful as the visions as we thought, as we once thought they were. We should probably explain for those that aren't familiar um, with all this, what, uh, you know, different editions and, and all that kind of stuff. All right. Uh, first of all, um, the, the Bible, uh, and we're specifically talking about the New Testament right now. Um, we don't have the original copies, what they call the autographs, the stuff that actually were Matthew and Luke and Paul, you know, put pen to paper. Those, I mean, those just don't exist. Papyrus doesn't last that well. All right. We have fragments we have that date back pretty early to show the stuff was being circulated. Um, very, for the most part, pretty small fragments. Um, where it'll, you'll see it'll just be a portion of a page. You can definitely tell, um, oh, this is part of the Bible. You know, they discover it and they go, oh, look, you know. Um, but, uh, but it's, it's really a bit later where they were started, uh, writing on, um, on, on vellum, uh, not vellum, um, parchment, leather, basically, um, that that stuff holds up better. And, um, and so we have newer, manuscripts which are still really ancient and um and it needs to be understood that that the the copies that we have of these ancient texts compared to when it was written um the fact that we have uh, uh a lot of stuff that the dates to like where we have you know whole books and stuff that are 150 years afterward you compare that with like with other stuff that was written around that time period that everyone accepts as, you know, this is, this is what it said and, and everything. Um, 
the copies of those that we have are much later. All right. Um, but this stuff was copied by hand. Okay. And because of that, there are differences in the ancient manuscripts that we found. All right. Not huge differences. Well, Mark chapter 16 is the biggest difference. Okay. But for the most part, like you have one manuscript where, all right, there's, there's two different words for and, d and chi. All right. And, uh, in, in one of the manuscripts, uh, where d can mean either and or but, and you have to figure it out from the context. Mm-hmm. And, but chi is always and. And, um, but there's one manuscript where all of the d's have been replaced with chi. So it's always chi. So like that, whoever that copyist was decided for whatever reason to put in all these chi's. And, and so a lot of it is like that. Other places you have like, for instance, the, um, the long ending of the Lord's prayer, the, the doxology for thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, or, well, forever. I guess the end ever doesn't really translate, but anyway, um, you know, that, that part of it, um, was probably added in later. Um, and it, at least in, in one of the places where it appears, uh, if not both. And, um, you know, so there's these, these real minor kind of things. Oh, there's another bit where the disciples are going to, uh, um, they're going to a party and they say, Jesus, are you going to this party? And, and Jesus says, no, I'm not going. And then later he shows up. And so in some manuscripts it says, no, I'm not going yet. Uh, like somebody said, oh, oh, that sounds like Jesus is lying. We should, we should fix that, you know? And, uh, well, you know, maybe he was just saying, no, I'm not going for the reason you think, you know, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll go later, but I'm not, it's not what you're thinking, you know? Um, so, so yeah, there's these minor differences, all right? The word of God has been preserved. And, and as you look at these ancient, um, uh, you know, when they find the, this papyrus and stuff like that, um, you can see that it's not like there've been drastic differences, uh, where the stuff's been, you know, re-edited and, and, you know, just massive changes and things that, um, never got said or, you know, it's just, it's minor changes. There's no, there's no like changes in doctrine, uh, unless you're a, you know, snake handler up in the mountains, um, <clears throat> that, you know, that are big changes. Um, and so, when you get a copy of a Greek New Testament, there's um, little uh, footnotes and, and things like that, what they call the critical apparatus, where you can see the variations in the manuscripts. Um, so that, you know, you as you're reading, you can say, well, this manuscript has this, this manuscript has this other thing. You know, sometimes it's a matter of letters that got grouped together in different ways or, or things like that. And... Um, and then you kind of look at it and kind of decide for yourself, um, based on whatever method you use of which is the correct reading and that. And, and so, um, over the years, the, the of these different editions, uh, for the most part, and for what, 35 years, um, there hasn't been actual change in the text. There's just been changes in the footnotes based on new manuscripts that have been discovered and things like that. Right, but now they're actually changing the text. In other words, what words they use as the, um, where you're just reading through it without checking the footnotes to see the variations. Um, there's actual changes in what they chose for that, for those words, which is generally what the translators, you know, when you get an English Bible, they tend to use the, um, the sort of accepted readings. Although the, once in a while there's, you'll see, you know, NIV text note and it'll have the, you know, there's also a variant reading here that's this. You know. So that, and then that brings us to 28 where, yeah, so they, they change some of the words. And so, uh, for instance, it gives the example of, uh, in Jude 5, passage with important Christological implications, um, the 28th edition, the new edition, um, Prince uh, <clears throat> Asos as the one who delivered, or oh, that's it's not showing you right. Jesus, all right, um, as Jesus, as the one who delivered his people out of Egypt in place of Kurios, which means Lord, 
um, or theos, um, which means God. Right? So, like, you know, as Christians, we look at that and go, well, Jesus is God and he is the Lord. And, and so, you know, it doesn't really change anything. But the point is that, um, that it's emphasizing we're not, okay, so yeah, it's, it's God. It's the Lord. But specifically, Jesus is that. And it's sort of emphasizing that Jesus is, um, the one who he is the same God, the same Lord who saved the people from Egypt. And, um, and he also points out that the ESV translation um, actually uses Jesus in that passage. So there, um, which is uncommon, um, they've actually chosen to use one of these variant readings, which the new um, 28th edition is is actually choosing to use too. Right. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting about this is the fact that... Uh, one of the things they, they're, they're admitting is we're never going to get recreate the original autographs. You know, I like the way he puts it. Uh, you know, where previous generations emboldened by confidence in science, which was made only possible by the Enlightenment, claimed to reproduce the New Testament in the original Greek. Now they admit eh, trying to figure that out is probably never going to happen. Yeah, you, know, you can come up with the hypothetical text, but you can never, you know, be absolutely sure that is the original text. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, you know, produce, reproducing an autograph of any New Testament writing is an impossible task given the available evidence. Uh, and so uh, 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 they also uh, no longer try to come up with some sort of conjuncture in the, the apparatus that are already thing. The other cool thing about this one is that there's going to be an online electronic version. Right, because the 20th edition isn't actually done. They've only no, done the, the 28th Catholic edition is, is finished. It's published. But the well, uh, but what they did was they took out a lot of the stuff that's now at the bottom and they put it online so that uh, some of the uh, apparatus and maybe stuff that's a little bit more esoteric and not quite so important um, – is now been moved out into something else. So yeah, so the you know you get the online edition, and not only do you get more information if you're you know a really serious uh, manuscript uh, sort of uh, you know if that if that's your expertise or or you you really pay close attention to that stuff, um, you know you can get the details of which papyrus said this or you know whatever. Um, but it's also it's going to keep getting updated. Uh, they've only done a small chunk of it so far, and uh, so actually, yeah. Um, what is it they said? Um, they expect to have the whole Bible, or the whole New Testament, redone and you know updated, uh, and all the things by the year uh, twenty thirty. So you know, I mean, we're, we're only talking you know almost another eighteen years. I'll be you know the year I'll be seventy nine when it's finished. <laughs> Um, and, um, so that's going to be kind of, kind of interesting, uh, is that part. Um, uh, the other thing that's interesting, um, yeah, yeah, 35 years, they said, for a new, for, for the final edition to be, to be made. That's going to be a, that, that, that's a monumental undertaking. You know, we don't always think of things like, you know, a lifetime, real, you know, talk about a lifetime of work, but right there, it just about mm-hmm. is. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I, uh, yeah, I just, I love this idea that, you know, they're working on it and you don't have to wait for it to be done. You know, you can get these updates. All right. Well, we got this chunk done. So here, you know, you can use that. I, that's tremendous. Now I'm normally, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably not going to go out and, and get this. Um, I've, I actually, um, when I'm working with the Greek, I'm, Generally, just because it's uh, what my <laughs> particular uh, Bible uh, program I use the old online Bible yet for Mac, and um, and so it, it uses the Westcott Hort, um, which is I, I don't even know exactly how that works, but uh, you know I, I don't work with all the apparatus and stuff like that, 
um, because I, I think you can really bore people if you start talking about, you know, textual variants and stuff like that. Every once in a while, you know, there's something, you know, there's a, there's a interesting thing here where, uh, like, was it in the, 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 the rich young ruler, um, who, and I forget which, uh, which gospels version of it is because, uh, multiple ones give this, this story, um, where he comes to Jesus and the whole, um, you know, what must I do to be saved? And, um, he says, well, you know, obey the 10 commandments. And the guy says, oh, I've done all that since I was a kid. And, and there's two, there's a, a variant there. You should, usually you see, um, and, and Jesus loved him or, um, you know, he was sort of like deeply moved with compassion for him. Um, and, but there's this variant that says Jesus was angry with him. <laughs> um, and oh, no, wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. No, it's not that story. Um, it's the, um, it, it's the one, the, is it the man born blind? Oh, crud. And anyway, where Jesus says, where he says, if you can, I really should have looked this one up. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it's, if, uh, if you, if, if, like, you can heal me if you want to, or, or something like that. And, but yeah, the, the, anyway, the variant is, there's one variant, most of them say, um, you know, Jesus was moved with compassion. Then, but yeah, there's this sort of obscure variant reading that says, you know, Jesus was angry with them, and then you kind of talk about like, well, why might Jesus have been angry here? Um, you know, and and so it can allow you to to take a little bit of a just a slightly different look at a text. Um, but for the most part, you know, when, when I'm putting a sermon together, I'm gonna work with the text that is used. Uh, for the English translation, otherwise it's going to confuse people unless there's something, you know, really seems off to me, uh, where I know that I happen to know, you know, that there's this other reading, um, is, is the one that I think makes more sense there or something like that. So. Yep, you're right. So. Anyway, I hope everybody uh, enjoyed this evening's broadcast or podcast. It was certainly good. If you have any questions, thoughts, can uh, consider anything else, please feel free to uh, email us at crossfeed at, uh, at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Yep. Or if you're watching this on YouTube or something like that, just leave a comment. Um, or you can uh, go to our Facebook page, like us on Facebook. Uh, just look for Crossfeed Religious News and you'll find it. And... Um, and, uh, you know, leave a comment there and, um, love to hear from you. So thanks everybody and good night and God bless. Mm-hmm.